With Battleground Blitz becoming a rated game mode in the War Within prepatch, people have been queuing this game mode like crazy. To nobody's surprise, many of the people trying out this game mode are still a bit unfamiliar with Battlegrounds or how BG Blitz changes things, and will actually end up throwing winnable games over not knowing this information. Today, I'll be sharing everything I can about Arathi Basin to help you make the best decisions so that you can secure victory and outplay your opponents. Whether you're a seasoned veteran or a newcomer to PvP, this guide will give you the edge you need to come out on top. Let's dive right in to the BG Blitz Tactics. Alrighty, so for today we'll be taking a look at Arathi Basin. So just a brief overview of Arathi Basin, especially if you're newer to PvP, is that it is a base control map with five bases. How Arathi Basin changes in the Battleground Blitz context is that the time it takes to capture a flag has been reduced to 4 seconds from the original 6 seconds in the normal Battleground setting. Additionally, after a 30 second window, the base will lock for whatever faction captured it and will not unlock for the next 45 seconds. After that 45 seconds passes, there is a brief period of invulnerability on the flag and then the base will become capturable again. So for some general housekeeping before we get right into the battleground and all the tactics and all the good information itself is that there are three useful add-ons that I personally like to run when it comes to playing battleground blitz and you can get these add-ons off of curse forge I think there's there may be some other ways directly from the site or whatnot but the three that I use are going to be battleground enemies big debuffs and capping battleground enemies will give you a list of every single enemy whatever specialization they are all of their pvp trinkets and will even track their diminishing returns for the whole enemy team. It's also really useful because it allows you to click on their frame, and if you click on the frame in the add-on, it will actually target the enemy so you can use this for tracking where the enemies are at. It is a very powerful add-on in Battlegrounds and in Battleground Blitz, and I would even argue that it is mandatory for finding success in this new game mode. Number two is big debuffs, and it does two separate things. Number one, is it will show on your team's raid frames if you have a teammate that is stuck in crowd control. This is very useful for knowing specifically if your healers are stuck in crowd control and can help you make a better decision on whether or not you need to use a defensive cooldown. Additionally, what it'll do is it'll show a very large icon next to the enemy's nameplate if they have a major cooldown active, such as Combustion for Fire Mages or Avenging Wrath for Ret Paladins. And again, it serves a similar purpose of helping you decide whether or not it's a good idea to press a defensive cooldown and overall gives you very valuable information. And in the Battleground Blitz context, capping is a very useful add-on that tells you when exactly a base is going to be capped and how much time is left on that timer. Additionally, I would recommend you get details. Details can give you a lot of useful information such as your damage done, healing done, crowd control, dispels interrupts. It's a very useful add-on, even though it's not inherently needed, I would still highly recommend it. So when it comes to winning Arathi Basin, the best possible strategy actually varies dependent on your role. And here's what I mean. So the best way I can split all of the 39 specializations up in the game in a battleground context is to five unique roles. Obviously being tank and healer, as two of them, then a melee DPS, a ranged DPS, and a stealth role. In the Battleground Blitz setting where you have 8 people on each team, you are guaranteed that you're going to be having 2 healers, and your strategy could vary a little bit dependent on if you have a tank, for instance, if you have multiple stealths, for instance. But not only does your role affect your strategy, but also how you should play depending on what class and what role you are to be the most effective for your team. So. We'll go over that a little bit now since this is the first episode of possibly a series. Or if this is a standalone concept, then I still want you to become familiar with this because this is crucial for performing your absolute best in Battlegrounds. Now, before we go over the five roles and what their responsibilities are, you may be asking, well, Moon, how do I know what role I am? How do I know if I'm a stealth or if I'm a ranged DPS or a melee DPS? No need to fret. I got you covered right here. I came up with this chart, not a tier list, it is just a chart showing you what specialization goes into what role. You will see that there are some specs such as Balanced Druid, Marksman Hunter, and BM Hunter that can actually fill multiple categories, and their play style can vary depending on if there's other stealths on the team, if there is a need for more ranged DPS, if the composition is more oriented to win via a team fight as opposed to hitting off bases. So it's important to know that even though this is a general guideline of what specializations go into what role, is that your role can fly a little bit. So with that being said, let's go over our first role, which will be the tank. So with a tank on Arathi Basin, your main objective is going to be to look to spin a base. Specifically in this instance, I'm going to say Blacksmith. And the reason why I believe you should spin Blacksmith over any other base is it is because it is the central base in the map. 
whatever team controls the blacksmith essentially has the keys to the kingdom because they get to spawn at that graveyard which allows them easy access to all four of the other bases. What do I mean by spin a base? Essentially what you're going to do is you are going to rotate through defensive cooldowns while using your offensive abilities on top of the flag of that base. And essentially what you're doing as a tank is you are being there, you're being annoying, you're being a nuisance to try to kill. But rather than trying to directly take the base, for instance, you are more so trying to block the enemy team from capturing the base. And so what this does by spinning blacksmith or by, by spinning a base in general as a tank is that you are creating space for your other teammates to try to make plays off of. There's a saying that goes along the lines of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's sort of the same thing where an ounce of disruption is worth a pound of trying to make up for your team losing a base. And lastly, you're going to try to bait unfavorable fights for the enemies. As a tank, let's say you have three or four people that come to the blacksmith and they're trying to kill you and you're able to stall them out for a really long time. This is a good thing. You are trying to stall them. You are trying to keep yourself alive as long as possible to allow your team to have unfair advantages on other bases of the map. So even if you do go down and even if they do get blacksmith, you are creating those windows for your other teammates to make plays across the map. I feel like a lot of tanks will get ahead of themselves because in a flag carry map such as Warsong Gulch or Twin Peaks for instance, they are essentially the main character when it comes to being the flag carry. But when it comes to a base map such as Arathi Basin, you are acting more of a support and that's perfectly okay. But these are gonna be your main responsibilities as a tank. Let's go over healers next. I'll admit, I have probably the most to say about the healer role than any other role because I happen to main healer and I play multiple healers, but I've also played all the other roles on this list as well, just giving my bias out in advance. But as a healer, your best strategy is going to be largely dependent on what healer you play. I know the answer, it depends, isn't really the answer that a lot of people are wanting to immediately hear, but you don't play a Holy Paladin the same way that you would play a Restoration Shaman. I actually have a VOD that I'll go over later in this guide to kind of show you what I mean by that. Because some healers are more teamfight oriented while others are more in line to help stall out another base. So the main thing that you'll want to do is you'll want to secure and split. What do I mean by this? When you are on a Rathi Basin and you are one of two healers on a team, outside of the first team fight, you should almost never be at the same base as the other healer. So I'll go ahead and demonstrate this with a graphic right here, but essentially because Arathi Basin is such a massive map, you want to ensure that yourself and the other healer are positioned in a way where you can cover as much ground as possible should your teammates need healing. In this graphic right here, you can see that our effective range of being able to heal is not that great if we are clumped up together, but if we are hovering between different roads of the map and are between different bases, our effective healing range becomes a lot greater. Additionally, you are going to be rotating as soon as possible to help struggling bases. It is perfectly okay to pop a cooldown and top off your teammates that are winning a team fight and bail out of the team fight before it's completely over to go help another base that's struggling. And sometimes it is okay to cut a loss and take a slight disadvantage than to try to go all in on a failing play and have multiple bases get captured because you weren't where you needed to be at the right time. A lot of your responsibility revolves sort of around this theme of positioning. Are you at the right place at the right time? And unfortunately, a lot of responsibility falls on you as a result of it because of how powerful you can be in a battleground scenario. So something else you're going to be doing is you're going to be matching the enemy healer numbers. What do I mean by this? You're going to be tracking the enemy healer's location, and if one healer goes to a base, you are at that base helping the fight out. You are going to be matching the enemy healer one for one because in instances where you have these small skirmishes across the map, and granted, you know, there's five bases and only eight people that could be at each base, these small skirmishes matter a lot more in Battleground Blitz. 99% of the time, if you are in a skirmish and one team has a healer, the other team doesn't have a healer, the team who has a healer is going to beat the team that does not have the healer. So not only can you use these scenarios to give your team an unfair advantage in these small skirmishes that can help you lock down a base, you can also prevent the enemy team from having those advantages by making the fights more fair across the map. And lastly, you're going to be spinning flags when you can. If you are in a team fight and you have DPS players that are going at each other, they're sending out a large amount of damage. They are going to be more so focused on killing each other. So if you can find these windows where the DPS or the other healers are distracted, you can click on the flag and try to get a sneaky flag capture. 
because it's one thing for a damage dealer to stop doing damage and putting pressure on the enemy team to try and take the flag. It's actually less of a team loss for you to stop healing for a little bit to try and take the flag. Additionally, in BG Blitz as well, since the flag cap time is only 4 seconds, you can cap the flag and still keep your team alive at the same time. So with that being said, let's move on to the melee DPS. With melee DPS, you are looking for team fight opportunities. You are the front line of team fight composition. You're going to be looking for favorable team fight scenarios where you outnumber the enemy, and you're going to be applying pressure by doing a large amount of damage and using your healing reduction effect while looking to crowd control enemy healers. A lot of melee DPS, they'll tend to get this sort of tunnel vision where they'll try to go all in and they'll try to kill the enemy healer, but they will be eating a ton of damage in return and not really find the result that they're looking for. However, because you are in the front line, you are often close enough to the enemy healers where you can briefly go out of your way to crowd control them and having them sit that six seconds, that four seconds in the crowd control can often be enough to kill someone on the enemy team and get your team the edge you need to win the team fight. I don't really have much else to say because you do have the most straightforward role out of the five and even though it is very straightforward and easy to execute, it is still a crucial role for the team's success. Let's move on to the ranged DPS now. For the ranged DPS, you're going to be hovering bases. What do I mean by this? Because you have spammable crowd control and you often have very good zone control, you are more so going to be the people that will capture the base and briefly hover around the area to ensure that it locks for your faction. Additionally, because your attacks and your spells are ranged, it is less of a commitment for yourself to rotate from base to base because you don't need to travel as great of a distance as a melee DPS would if they were to rotate a base and try to get their damage out. Additionally, you are going to be utilizing your spammable crowd control, especially when it comes to healers. Ranged DPS, you guys have some of the best crowd control in the game. Whether it be Polymorph from Mages, whether it be Cyclone from Balanced Druids, or Fear from Warlocks. The fact that you can use your crowd control over and over and over again on multiple targets too can help shift a team fight into your favor. Additionally, you're going to be utilizing slows to disrupt the enemy from being able to rotate out of the base. For instance, let's say the enemy melee DPS overextends into your team and they take a bad team fight and they realize that another base needs help and they're trying to escape. Often have a lot of slows or utility in your class that allows you to control the enemy and prevent them from getting from point a to point b in the window of time that they need to get there by your last main objective is that you are applying pressure with spread damage and zone control range dps often have some insane damage when it comes to battlegrounds thoughts that come to mind are boomkin or affliction warlock and so if you're utilizing all of these things this is how you can shift the variables to become more in your favor. And the last category we're going to go over are the stealth DPS. So the stealth DPS, you guys are going to be the playmakers. You are going to be looking for base capture windows. You're going to be hovering bases. You're going to be bouncing between them, capturing them whenever they come off of cooldown. But you are going to be looking for these windows of opportunity, whether it be when a base has been tagged and is in that 30 second window before it's captured or if a base is coming off of its vulnerability period from being locked and either has nobody there or only has one person there that you can use your crowd control on. And with these windows of opportunity, you are going to be looking to use your crowd control to help secure the bases. Rogues are especially phenomenal in this game mode because they have enough crowd control in their kit to be able to solo capture bases even through PvP trinkets. Everybody knows about the notorious sap cap or the sap into a blind if somebody were to blunder their medallion. While we can go a little bit more over that concept later, understand that you can be the playmaker by using your crowd control correctly to secure these bases. And the main avenue of how you're going to do that is through monitoring the enemy positioning. So by using an add-on such as Battleground Enemies, you can click through everybody's nameplates so you can tell what bases don't have people at them to where you can look to go hit. More often than not, if you are a stealth class, if you're like a rogue or a hunter or a druid or something like that, you're often not going to be in blacksmith at all. You're going to be looking for these plays either on the outside of the map or you're going to be looking for the plays on, on opposite ends of the map like stables and farm. Now that that's out of the way, let's go over the main strategies when it comes to winning a Rathi Basin. The most popular strategies are the three base strat and the four base strat. Three bases are going to be a little bit better for if you have a team fight heavy team, so a team with a lot of 
melee DPS, or with teams that have ranged DPS such as a Frost Mage or an Affliction Warlock. And the four base strategy will be better for teams that may be a little bit weaker in team fight but have more stealth DPS on their team. So we will cut over to the actual map itself in Microsoft Paint and I will show you how this goes into action. All right, so you'll have to pardon the Microsoft Paint. I'm not the best when it comes to graphics, but the information's the information. So let's start with the three base strategy. When it comes to the three base strategy, you're gonna be hedging your bet on winning the initial team fight. Now we're gonna go over this a little bit later, but the script is for the most part is that there is always going to be a fight at Lumber Mill or at least in about 85 to 90 percent of your games it'll hinge around the first fight at lumber mill so what you're going to do is you're going to send the majority of the team fight to the lumber mill you're going to have one person capture stables or farm if you're the horde and then you are also going to send some people to blacksmith to go ahead and spin that base there so you're probably going to want to commit both of your healers to the lumber mill fight and then you're going to want to commit one of the more survivable dps such as like a druid to blacksmith or you might even want to have one of the healers peel out but this will largely depend on the number of people that the enemy team commits to sending to lumber mill now with the four base strategy you are still going to be sending some people to lumber mill and i would even are you sending one of your healers to lumber mill but your objective is not going to be to win the team fight at lumber mill your objective is instead going to be to stall out the fight for as long as possible so that your other teammates can hit the other bases. So let's say you're Horde in this instance and you want to go for the four base strategy. You're going to send one healer to Lumber Mill. You're going to send either your tank or you're going to send a DPS and a healer to Blacksmith. You're going to put one person at farm and then you're going to go for mines. Rather than say sending four or five people to Lumber Mill, let's say you send only three and you send the remaining people to mines. This will almost guarantee that you win this mines fight because at most, they'll probably only send a rogue or like a hunter or one person to mines. And so this way you can get these three bases in your favor. You can even push up two stables, depending on how long it takes for this team fight to actually end at Lumber Mill and vice versa if you happen to be the Alliance and you're trying to go for farm. So that's the general concept of the three base versus four base strategy. If you were to do the three base strategy and you were to win the fight at Lumber Mill, but let's say you lose Blacksmith, the best play would be to probably push up to farm or push up to stables if you happen to win that fight because by the time this fight concludes these bases will be getting ready to uncap and will be the first bases that come up or capture again hey folks editor moon here so i want this guide to be as concise as possible and in the ms paint segment i end up yapping for another 20 minutes about potential strategies but the main focal point i want you to take away from this is that Regardless of what strategy you initially pick due to whatever your team composition is, the biggest advantage you can give yourself is by looking at what bases are coming up next and effectively rotating over to it, right? So if I'm at Lumber Mill and the fight concludes at Lumber Mill and Stables is about to come up and Farms about to come up, I need to make a decision to go to one of those bases and either recapture it or fight for it. So I can either get my team a base and capture the points there, or I can block the enemy team from getting a base and capturing their points. In this game mode, and in any other map I go over in Battleground Blitz, objectives are always king. You should be either at a base or going towards a base, right? If you are fighting in a road, if you find yourself in a situation as a DPS or a healer and you are fighting in a road, you are wrong. If you are here, you are wrong. If you are here, you are wrong. If you are even over here, you are wrong. You should always be either at a base or on your way to a base. Only possible exception that I would give is for healers if they are deciding to hover between bases so that they can better respond to whatever base needs help right so for instance we'll put a healer here and we'll put another healer here this would be the only exception just so that the healers would have easier access to bases but if you're a dps you should not be fighting on the roads ever so that's all we'll be going over some general tips now that are specific to arathi basin all right so let's go over some general tips for arathi basin and for base maps in general the first is that bases take four seconds to cap and they lock after 30 seconds. We went over this a couple times in the video already, but what this actually means is that you can leave the base after 26 seconds and you can track this using the capping add on. But after 26 seconds, it is physically impossible for anybody to be able to capture the base when they start the cap at that point, meaning 
if you are on your mount and you're ready to go, you have an extra four seconds that you're able to leave for another base. Because the mount speed is so fast on Arathi Basin and Deepwind Gorge compared to the other maps, this can be the make or break that can help you secure a base. The next tip I got for y'all is to pay attention to what your own teammates are doing and adapt. I know we went over some sample strategies that you can use earlier, but it's important to understand that in this solo duo game mode, not everything is going to go optimally and you cannot control what the other six or seven people on your team are doing. So more often than not, you may have to take a suboptimal strategy when it comes to the game that you're in, and that's totally okay. One of my old homies who I used to play with that ended up teaching me the game and ended up teaching me how to become a good battleground healer told me that eight people doing the wrong thing together is often better than one person trying to go against the grain and do the right thing. We had a situation even today in another battleground blitz where we had a few people on the team that wanted to go with this absolutely bonkers strategy that would just be very difficult to pull off since we weren't coordinated, but because the majority of the team saw it and decided to go along with it, it ended up working in our favor and we ended up blindsiding the enemy team and pulling off a cheeky win because of it. So even though the things that you're learning in this guide particularly are going to help you become better when it comes to your own decision making, understand that sometimes you may have to make a decision that's not optimal and that's okay. The next thing is to pay attention to where your enemies are and adapt to the situation. As we went over earlier, especially with that scenario where a bad team fight is baited and We'll go over this a little bit more in the VOD review because this is exactly what happens. By having good awareness and understanding where your enemies are at, it can allow you to make split second decisions to either commit to a plan or abort it and go with something else and overall make better decisions on what base you need to be at at that given moment. So much of the importance of a Rathi Basin and of these base maps is being at the right place at the right time, fulfilling your role on the team and allowing your teammates to be able to have an easier time to succeed. You doing your role to the absolute best of your ability is not going to be the determining factor all the time on if your team wins or loses, but it will make it easier for your team to do their roles correctly. Tip number four, and this is so, so, so important for you folks that are newer or maybe a little bit lower rated in these base maps, such as Arathi Basin, fight on the flag and hover off the flag. What do I mean by this? If you are in a team fight scenario, let's say you're at Lumber Mill or let's say you're at Blacksmith, the melee DPS and the range DPS want to be fighting as close to the flag of the base as possible, where you can use your AoE damage and your cleave damage to be able to stop enemies from being able to take the base out from underneath you. So many times have I seen people try to get greedy when chasing an enemy and go so far off the flag that the enemy healer will end up taking the base from underneath them. And then additionally, if you have the base and you're waiting out that 30 seconds for that base to lock in your faction, you should hover off of the flag and away from it. For range DPS, this is preferably going to be at about that 40 yard range where your abilities can still hit the flag, but you are as far away as possible from that flag. And this is to make sure that you are not getting baited by crowd control. Because if you are a range DPS and you are sitting at a flag and you're waiting for it to capture and you are by yourself, that is a open invitation for any rogue or any hunter to come and try to CC you and take the flag out from underneath you. It is the absolute worst feeling in the world to be sap capped is what the, the phrase is called, where you are sapped for six seconds and the rogue just takes the flag and you can do nothing about it. When you get a little bit higher up as well, rogues will often try to bait you to use your medallion by sapping you first and faking a cap, where whenever you trink it, you get blinded out of it and the rogue will then still get the flag because there's nothing you can do to get out of that blind. So ensuring that you are playing a safe distance away from the flag is going to help your team drastically. And the last tip and the most important tip I could give is to never blunder your medallion. This goes for anyone regardless of what role you are. A lot of people, they'll get greedy, they'll get caught up in the moment where they're trying to land an important kill. They'll use their medallion aggressively to break that crowd control, but then they'll eat a polymorph or then they'll eat a fear. And that's enough for somebody to take a flag out from underneath them, stall for 30 seconds and lock the base because they got greedy at that, that right time and that right moment. Now, if you've exhausted absolutely everything, and you see the enemy still trying to capture the flag and you need to stop that capture from happening, it's totally okay then to use your trinket in that scenario. But understanding that your crowd control trinket is very important and it not being up for two minutes or a minute and a half if you're a healer is a much bigger deal than you would expect, doubly so because 
Battleground Blitz is a faster game pace than a regular Arathi Basin Battleground. So now that we got some general tips out of the way, let's go ahead and go on over the VOD review that I have. This is a Battleground Blitz that I just played earlier today. We're going to be taking a look at what went right, what went wrong, and breaking down some of the concepts we talked about earlier in real time. So that being said, let's go ahead and get right on over to the VOD review. Alright, so we got ourselves a Battleground Blitz game of Arathi Basin that I just played today. So we're going to be going over what went right, what went wrong, and touching on some concepts that I went over in the guide previously. So something you should be doing, especially as a Shaman player, is give everybody water walking. I do that, and then I tell everybody in the chat that they have water walking. Death Knights have this too, but especially if you're on the Alliance side of Arathi Basin, it gives you easier access to Blacksmith since you have a direct path, and you can actually get to the flag before the Horde does if you have water walking. Game starts in 7 seconds. We don't have a strategy going in. I am just going to follow the default strategy of going to the Lumber Mill fight, reacting to what the enemy team does, and going from there. Something really cool that I'll go ahead and pause the video when it pops up is if you hit the Shift and M as in map, you'll get this little mini map that pops up on the bottom of your screen so you don't constantly have to open the map. And this is good so that you don't have to flicker the map over and over and over again or have to worry about that. You, you just have everybody's position on the mini map right here at all times. Granted, I like looking at the map because it's easier to see generally, but I can also use this as quick reference. Let's get back to the VOD. So right now, I'm just clicking through both the healers, the Mistweaver and the Discipline Priest, and I see that both of them are going to be committing to this Lumber Mill fight. I'm a little bit thrown off because there are six people that decide to show up to Lumber Mill, whereas my team only sends three. But if we take a look at the current map situation, I know it's a little bit hard to see, so I wonder if I can maybe get this bar to disappear. I'll go ahead and take a screenshot of that minimap and then put it up on the screen right now, but as you can see, my monk decided to commit to mines. One of the warlocks, the death knight, and the holy paladin decided to first cap stables and then rotate over to blacksmith, which means that there's only four of us at this lumber mill fight compared to the six people on the enemy team. So I immediately know that my objective is not going to be to win this lumber mill fight, but to stall it for as long as possible and spin the flag to prevent the enemies from capturing it. So so we'll go ahead and see how this fight plays out. As you can see, I'm just throwing out cooldowns. I'm trying to keep my team alive as long as possible. This Mistweaver is going to be the person of interest in this fight. We're going to go ahead and stun him, do anything we can to prevent him from going onto the flag. And it looks like I kill a knock, or somebody tries to knock him, but he ends up porting back very smart on his play. Their front line is trying to steamroll through me to get to my casters, but I am trying to keep the fight on the flag for as long as possible because if they get the flag, the fight is over and they can rotate to another base. And just because of that, what's happening in the background is we got stables, we were able to get mines, my Windwalker ended up winning a 1v1 versus their hunter. We were able to get Blacksmith because we baited them into staying at Lumber Mill as opposed to aborting and going over to Blacksmith, and we are able to clutch up farm. Because I believe they decided to sit their demon hunter at farm, but the people that were at blacksmith ended up rotating over to farm to take that base too. So we are already at a massive advantage and we are going to get four bases off the rip. I end up blowing my CC trinket here because I get in crowd control. So I'll go ahead and rewind that 10 seconds for you. I ground the ultimate penance. But if I were to sit this full fear, they would get the flag cap. And I still am trying to stall, even though we have four bases, just to limit the response. So I am going to blow my trinket here, position myself to where I can get a knock, and I hit a really good knock, being able to hit both of their healers off the base. Unfortunately for me, what happens next is that the Elemental Shaman lands a really sick knock-up with Burrow into a Thunderstorm and throws me off the cliff too. I hit Wall, but I don't think Wall does anything for fall damage. I actually end up living getting knocked off the cliff because I am a panda and my racial bouncy allows me to take half fall damage. Not saying you should play panda for that specific reason, I just like playing panda. But I already see, if you look over to the right, that stables is about to come up in four seconds. So I'm going to take another look at my map here shortly and then orient myself to head towards stables. The Death Knight's pinging for assist, which I personally don't mind if you ping a lot. Some people will get annoyed. I know some people have even decided to tune out of my channel because of how much I ping, but personally, I like the system. I like being able to use it in a way to get somebody's attention. I like the sound effects that it makes. It's very good for communicating with your teammates, and you really should have them enabled. That being said, 
you shouldn't be spam pinging assist on your healer if your healer is pissing you off, right? There are good ways to use pings and there are bad ways to use pings. So I let the DK know that I'm on my way and it looks like their Mistweaver is actually going over to stables too. So I know that because my Holy Paladin is nowhere nearby, I need to stay here and commit to this fight. This fight continues to play out. It looks like we have a 3v3 situation going on. So we're just mainly stalling at stables and hoping that our team can make some other plays happen across the map. Again, I'm keeping their Mistweaver here, and we're going to try and stop him from getting the capture on the flag. They send a second Warlock to try and commit to this base. Oh, that was a pretty sick hex. I didn't see that there. But they send a second Warlock to come and commit to this base, meaning that we are now fighting a 3v4, meaning that our team has an extra person available on the map to go and make a play and take another base with, because my mana bar is near full, I can heal these people for as long as my mana bar lasts, and I still have multiple healing cooldowns at the ready. I believe this is our Death Knight's AMZ. Yeah, because there's the Ring of Peace that goes out. So our teammates rotating through defensive cooldowns. We can make this fight last as long as the game goes on, and I think that either does happen here or something similar of the sort happens. But again, we're still fighting off this 3v4. We're still stalling. If I were one of the Warlocks in this situation, I would personally bail and try to go hit another base, but we are just hitting these bases on repeat, and just like that, we have a 600 point advantage already over the enemies. But this is what I mean, I'm not just trying to blow smoke up your ass when I'm saying that you can bait people into bad fights to take, and use it as a catalyst to give your team unfair advantages on other spots of the map. So it looks like our team does decide to come over from Blacksmith. We we lock Blacksmith, we lock Lumber Mill, and we're able to ghost those bases for a little bit where our team can rotate over, help us win the fight, and help us capture stables. It's still a long slog to try and capture stables at this point, but we are just locking these three people on their team up. They can't go around, they can't do anything. We have a small fight going on at farm right now. Blacksmith just became available again. So we're gonna look to heal out of here and go back to Blacksmith. And it looks like our hunter, ooh, our hunter is really low. Ideally, our hunter would be doing that, but it seems as though being at 4% HP, he's got some other things to worry about at the moment. Uh, something that we're doing wrong on our team is that we are staying way too long at this fight. Now they are the one who has the advantage in this fight because they're fighting a 3v4. Even though they're about to go down, we're about to take the base, they still are wasting a lot of our time but it doesn't really seem like their team is able to connect and make any plays happen from that scenario. In fact, I don't believe they've gotten any bases aside from the initial lumber mill cap. So we end up winning this fight here at stables. We end up taking stables and let's see what happens. Go ahead and fast forward a little bit. It looks like I decided to go to blacksmith here. Uh, you can jump over. Yep, so we take Blacksmith. With the mount speed, what I was going to say is you can jump on the boxes, so it is possible to get over to Blacksmith super quick, but it does take some finessing to do, and I ended up missing it in this photo, so no need to worry about that. But we run through Blacksmith because it's fine, there's no immediate threats there, and we go to push in the farm, but I realize that the other healer is here, and I really should not be here for super long. So I drop my healing tide totem, I drop some initial heals, I dispel the other healer from the hex. I knock everybody off of the flag, and then I start to make my way out. Because again, unless you're doing the first team fight of the game, which is at Lumber Mill, or you're going for like a more team fight oriented game, you don't want both of the healers to be at the same base. I get stuck in the road with this warlock, who is spamming Curse of Exhaustion on me. I'm trying to crowd control him for a little bit, and really that's a big mistake on my part. I should not be stuck in the road for any reason at all. Um, but I am heading towards Blacksmith, and at that point it doesn't matter because we just win the game outright. So this game took place at about 1600 MMR. It is your very standard, average, run-of-the-mill game. I know MMR is a little bit all over the place just because rating was only added in a few days ago, so... It will take a couple weeks for everybody to get sorted out. And the same thing will happen too in The War Within, where I wouldn't expect things to be sorted out. Well, let's see, the season starts like September 10th, so 
give it to mid-October and you'll start to see brackets develop and, and then you'll be able to kind of pick out what the differences are between each bracket when it comes to gameplay. So this is the VOD review of how to win Arathi Basin. So I'll go ahead and close out the guide here. I hope that with this guide, you've been able to get a solid foundation of information regarding how to play on Arathi Basin, how Battleground Blitz affects it, and ultimately make better decisions the next time that you find yourself in this map in Battleground Blitz. There is no one-stop shop perfect way to win Arathi Basin because every single Battleground Blitz game will be different, but winning in Battlegrounds and in Battleground Blitz is a little bit different to winning in arenas because you are receiving information and then making decisions on it on a macro level compared to a micro level. So by having a good foundation of what you need to be doing, what everybody should be doing on the team in a macro sense, you can make the best decisions possible that will contribute to yourself winning the game. And I hope I've been able to give you what you need so that you can have that edge to win you those extra few percentage of games, which will help you climb in the ladder in the future. If you do have any more specific questions for me about Arathi Basin or about Battleground Blitz in general, go ahead and ask me in the comments section below. Or I do stream live on Twitch a couple days a week at Overlord Moon TV on Twitch. And I actually do play Battleground Blitz duo queue with viewers as well, if that's something that you would be interested in. So that being said, I'll go ahead and end the guide here. If you've learned something today or if you've liked what you saw, it would mean a lot if you could support the channel. And until next time, this is Moon signing out.